Welcome to Inspirational Journeys, everyone. My name is Ann Harrison, and this week, my special guest, Sean Tyler Foley, is going to talk to you about his book, The Power to Speak Naked. Welcome to the show, Tyler. Oh, thank you for having me, Ann. It's an absolute joy and a pleasure to be here. And I absolutely loved your book, by the way. So before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself to the, to the listeners and the viewers? Absolutely. So uh, professionally known as Sean Tyler Foley, amongst friends, I am Tyler, and that's why Anne said hello, Tyler. Um, <laughs> I am a father, a husband, uh, performer, speaker, author, seeker of warm beaches, and mm -hmm. uh, a lover of fine chocolate. And that's, oh. that's who I am. Oh, Ghirardelli. Anyway, let's not get off on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, could well, about well we we definitely could though and because a chocolate to me is one of the greatest gifts in the world because it doesn't matter who you are or what you do uh it speaks to a multitude of senses and i don't know a person alive who can't enjoy a little cocoa without uh without bringing a smile to their face mm -mm. and uh i i i love the fact even that in the uh, Harry Potter series, J.K. Rowling uh, used chocolate as a way to overcome the, the pure sadness that the Dementors bring on when you get a Dementor kiss, which apparently sucks your soul. And so the way to replenish your soul is to eat chocolate. Uh -huh. <laughs> that to me the seems frogs, about fitting. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. And the Ghirardelli is one of my favorites. Yes. Yes. Just a side note there. So let's talk about people are wondering, what do you mean by the power to speak naked? Oh, and that's an excellent question. So um, multi-layer. So let's dive down that rabbit hole. And uh, the power to speak naked on the surface is a kind of tongue in cheek jest at what is quite possibly the worst advice public speakers can <laughs> be given. You know, when, when, particularly when you're trying to get over stage fright, mm -hmm. one of the things everybody says, oh, you just picture your audience naked or you picture them in their underwear or whatever it is. And to me, that is so asinine and a complete waste. Of, and, and not only that, ineffective. It, it's, not a, it's not actually a thing that works um, for a multitude of reasons. One, you're wasting valuable brain power that could be used to remembering the thing that you want to say. Uh, trying to falsely imagine your audience in a state of discomfort. And the other thing is, is somehow you're trying to gain comfort out of somebody else's discomfort, which is really, really masochistic. And, uh, and just, it doesn't work. Like, it's just not a, a thing that works. Uh, so it's a little tongue in cheek that way, poking fun at the, at the really bad advice. Uh, the next uh, meaning behind the title would be the fact that I want people to be able to give a raw or naked presentation in that they don't need gimmicks, that the only thing they need is uh, themselves and their voice. They don't need a PowerPoint. They don't need props. They don't need an AV system. Uh, they, don't, they don't need all the extraneous uh, that I think a lot of people associate with public speaking now, unfortunately. The, we got to remember that Public speaking has been around, uh, depending on who you want to believe, at least a minimum of 4,500 years, more likely uh, into the 10,000 years, and that human beings have been communicating orally. Um, and we've been doing that long before the written word, even. Yeah, and, and so we don't, you know, I, I guarantee you, uh, Early Neanderthals and, and early human civilizations did not have PowerPoint. And, and even if they were doing cave drawings to illustrate their points, they were still talking without it. Um, so we don't need all of this stuff. All we need is our own voice and our own belief in our message. So the power to speak naked speaks to, to that as well. And then on its very upper surface and at its deepest, most root level, I genuinely want to empower people to feel so confident in their message that what they were saying was so compelling 
that the audience would never even know what they were wearing and that they could go on stage wearing the emperor's new clothes and a have the power to do it because they were they were so confident in their message that it wouldn't phase them and have their message so compelling that the audience didn't even notice that it wasn't even a, it didn't even matter because they were focused on their words and their message and not what what was being worn on stage so uh, a multi-layer title in the power to speak naked and it, and it really truly encompasses all of the above and it's an, and it grabs your attention too because it's like what but no when you said power to speak naked i remember reading in your book the the naked truth it's like be the your the your authentic self because like you mm -hmm. said back before the written word was even a thing so to speak um people were telling stories to mm -hmm. one another so you're right. Public speaking has been around a lot longer than, than the written word has. Well, and I love that you noted the raw naked truth because that's it, authenticity is one of those things that's become a real buzzword. And I actually really, it, it's almost nails on a chalkboard for me now when I hear about an authentic speaker. What I would love your audience to remember is that authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness that in order to be authentic, uh, you do need to know who you are at your core. And a lot of that includes exposing some of that raw naked truth to the world. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go out and tell everybody your deepest, darkest secrets, but you also can't be afraid to say the things that maybe uh, you're trying to protect, right? The soft, squishy parts of our soul sometimes need to be exposed in order for you to really gain traction, gain understanding with your audience. It's through the power of story and saying, this is, this is what I've experienced that we gain empathy and sympathy. And, you know, they often say, never judge a person till you've walked a mile in their shoes. Well, I can't walk a mile in your shoes. You know, mm -hmm. you and I uh, come from vastly different geographical regions um, upbringing, genetic makeup, and even our uh, abilities and disabilities are different. Exactly. But if you tell me your story, now I can experience the world through your point of view. I can understand what your world is to you so that I can then share in that experience and the more detailed your story the easier it is for me and a lot of that comes with you sharing some of those things that um that add texture and detail and layers to it and a lot of times that it, it means exposing some of those hard truths you know you pinpointed something that i've been thinking about a lot here lately that is one of the reasons why i started this podcast to meet new people authors you know, I started with entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs and artists as well, but I've talked to more authors, but to hear their stories. I like to hear the story behind the creative process and because of, you know, transportation issues or now with, with the pandemic and all that, it's hard for me to get, you know, to, and, and the expense of traveling, it's hard for me to get out into these areas and meet new people. So why not do it in this way? What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on using a podcast as a, it's a virtual one, but as a platform for the public speaking? Because I used to be scared to <laughs> do presentations in front of people. Well, and you know, it's funny, Anne, that I think one of the wonderful benefits that have come from the last 18 to 24 months mm -hmm is first of all, people's understanding for the need for human connection. That um, I think as a society, we were uh, one of the reasons I feel we were so fractured is because of this lack of connection. And I think we, it, the need for it has been thrust into the limelight. That people understand now that we as a species require interconnectivity. And I think one of the beautiful things about podcasts is, A, it's giving voice to people who wouldn't normally have it. 
Mm-hmm. It's also creating a wonderful community because you can now find subgenre topics on just about anything that you want. Yep. And there are some really fascinating niches out there. And I think one of the things too is so many people were forced <laughs> to get onto these virtual platforms and be visible that a lot of people were required then to start addressing their fear of public speaking, their fear of presentations. And what I think has been interesting, it's something that I've known for 35 years, and it's something that I've taught about for 10 to 12, is that I think people are understanding now they're not actually afraid of public speaking. We speak in public on a very regular basis. Uh, In fact, if we couldn't speak in public, commerce as we know it would collapse. You'd never be able to go to a bank. You'd never be able to go to a restaurant, right? Anybody who's been to a restaurant and ordered food has spoken in public. Mm -hmm. What the reality is, is we're afraid of public judgment. That we're afraid that the words that we're going to use are going to be misconstrued or misunderstood or somehow we will be judged for the things that we are saying in a negative light. And that is usually what prevents people from speaking up and using their voice. And so what I think has been great about the pandemic is that it has forced people to have to uh, use their voice because they can't be seen anymore. That you need to do hop on a Zoom call or, or do a thing. And, and that, I think, has been a joy of some a lot of the podcasts, too, that I've been on is that I've gotten to meet some incredible people, including yourself, who have, uh, you know, who have great stories themselves and and have this, these beautiful platforms. And so I think it, I think there's been a double-edged sword. It's a blessing and a curse. And I'm thankful every day that more and more people are finding a virtual medium to connect and, and learn and share stories. Yep. And I can say this because this is a faith-based podcast. I hope you don't mind this, but um, this is God's way of connecting me to other people. Yes. I started this in, nope. in go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and I, I think you're right. I think there is divinity in all the things, uh, that we do. Um, there's just too, too much evidence to the contrary. And I, I, I don't care what the denomination is. I don't care what the faith is. Regardless of your faith, I think you can see a higher power in in how the world works. And and I do think that this is one of those things where we are a fractured society. And as you said, that there is a benefit that comes to it if you look for it. And Mm -hmm. I I'm grateful that you recognize that this has been a way for you to be able to connect with people. Right. And I'm gonna be honest, when I do solo episodes. As some of you viewers, if some of you listeners and some of you viewers from my solo YouTube videos have noticed, I have to stop. I have to come to a close because if I don't, I will ramble. (laughs) So I I find doing interviews, I mean, I will do solo episodes, especially if I have a topic that I want to talk about. But I find sometimes doing interviews is a lot more, is is in, in one sense, I wouldn't, I don't want to say better because I do like doing the solo, you know, providing tips, but doing the interviews is a, is a form of, of that, of that connectivity that we all, that we all need. Yes. So uh, let's kind of take a turn in the writing process behind the book. I know you're an author and an actor as well. So what inspired you to write this book? Honestly, my daughter, um, Ah. when she was born, you know, anybody who's a parent will understand your world kind of shifts. Yep, it does. And I went from being able to be very selfish in my pursuits to having to consider a human life that was entirely dependent on me. and. As I started to think about the world that I wanted to create for her, I realized that as a young woman growing up, that she 
is not encouraged to speak the way that I am. And that had me frustrated because I, one of the great blessings that I got in my life was being provided the opportunity to have my voice valued and heard at a very young age. I started acting on stage when I was six years old. And especially now that my daughter has turned six, there's a real um, identifier. Like I, a lot of the key moments in my life happened in, in my first year of school in the first grade and watching my daughter now go through that. I'm, I'm reliving a lot of it and I'm seeing where I had these blessings and these, these great opportunities. And I want her to have a voice. I don't ever want her to feel that her opinion isn't valued um, or that she has to diminish her light in any way or that her opinion doesn't matter. And unfortunately, in the society that we live in, despite the strides that we've tried to make, the female voice is not as valued as the male voice for some reason, yeah. which I think is a, is a shame because for a long time and in many other societies within the world. So there are pockets in the world that are matriarchal in, um, in design. And, but I find in North America, and I, I see this even with my wife, who's a, a brilliant, brilliant project manager, the amount that she has to fight to have her opinion heard over some of her male counterparts um, really bothers me, actually. And I grew up in a household of women and I, and, and I know the value of all human voices. Like, I don't think one is, is greater than the other. I just think that they all have a, a solid viewpoint that needs to be heard. And when I think of my daughter growing up, I want her to know that she will be listened to. And so this book was really, uh, I'm, I dedicated it to her for that very reason that I wanted her to have the power to speak whatever she wanted to do. You know, you brought out another good point. Not only is the female voice so devalued, voices of people with disabilities mm -hmm. are, don't they, they, we, it's like, we don't know what we're talking about. I've, I've had that happen many times. Oh, and uh, you and I were having a great conversation offline where, uh, you know, even though you can say this is this is the experience that I'm having, again, with somebody not being able to to sit in your seat and literally not see <laughs> what what is going on as exactly. part of the problem. Uh, a good friend of mine and a, a client that I've worked with a few times, Tanel Bolt, who's a phenomenal uh, advocate for um, for accessibility. Uh, she uh, used to model beautiful, beautiful woman and uh, had a, a, an accident um, jumping off of a bridge, um, you know, summertime fun into water. And one of her friends dove off and, and, and was having fun. And then she dove off and, uh, and fractured her spine and Ooh. is paraplegic. And, you know, she has dedicated the, the last number of years to really finding a voice because she had a platform previously and now she's using that platform to really show some of the accessibility things. And she put up a post just last week. Uh, we've had a lot of snow up in Canada and uh, the West Coast, particularly where she's located, has had more snow than, than they would regularly have. And the you know, store owners and city are responsible for clearing the sidewalks and the accessibility ramps. And she kept complaining to the city that this, that this, that it's not happening, that it's not cleared. And they're like, oh no, we've cleared it. And she's like, no, 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 you've swept snow, but you've created this huge mound of snow in front that any person who has accessibility issues cannot overcome this and finally she got so frustrated that she actually went out and set up a video camera on the corner of an intersection and it's a busy intersection with a lot of traffic and she mm. showed just how difficult it was for her to get over the two uh crosswalks that she needed to do and in the video you can actually see a car damn near take her out 
Ooh. And yet the city is still saying that they've cleared the walk and that it's okay while she is struggling. And she has modified tires on her because she she uh, runs a, a, a program called RAD um, and it's for outdoor enthusiasts who have accessibility issues to be able to still participate in some of these extreme sports that mm -hmm. they enjoy. So she has, you know, kayaking and hiking and biking and, and she does uh, golf. Um, she has this really cool um, machine that allows her to go around a golf course. And so she loves to promote this stuff. And so she has this incredibly modified wheelchair that can handle some pretty gnarly situations. And she still couldn't get over this, you know, six inch mound of slushy, slushy, wet West coast snow. Mm -hmm. And a car literally comes within two inches of taking her out while she's struggling to try and get up it. And she, she spent a good, probably 30 to 40 seconds spinning her wheels in the slush. So you're right that there, there are so many different ways where various voices are diminished. And uh, again, to your point of, of having a podcast, this is a, a, an amazing opportunity for people to have a platform to say, hey, these are the issues that I'm experiencing. And this is how I am experiencing the world. And I think that that is one of the great um, values that are being provided right now. Right, because accessibility is key. And these companies that don't provide it and then, or, or if they don't know how to provide it, then they need to talk to people who, who know, who can link, can pinpoint or send them to, to companies that can help them. Because well, and I think that's really the key there, Anne, right, is having those conversations and knowing that they're conversations that need to be had, because I don't think people know that there's an issue until they point it out, right? We don't, we truly don't understand our own biases. Right. because we're numb to them exactly and here's the thing i was at a webinar and i asked an accessibility question about the podcast platform that was being was being talked about my question got completely ignored mm -hmm. so i'm like okay <laughs> i'm not going i'm go not going to another training with this company because they ignore the accessibility issue and i know that's yeah. that may be wrong but don't don't but but sweeping it under, under the rug is not the answer. And I know we've gotten off on a tangent, but, you know, maybe this is where we need to go today. <laughs> you know how that works? God works in mysterious ways, folks. Uh, so tell me about the process behind that. I know you, you know, you, you coach people. Did you have to do a lot of research to put the book together? Did you have to do a, a, ba a major outline? Or was it just the book just based on experiences that you've had? Yeah, so the book actually came together. Uh, oddly enough, I didn't write it. I spoke it, which I think is suiting for a book called The Power to Speak Naked. Okay. And I'm sure you will appreciate this, um, that you know, there's wonderful technology out there that allows speech to text. And uh, amazing ways of transcribing all sorts of, of mediums. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who has grown up in the arts, I have countless hours of video of me. And over the last, like I said, 10 to 12 years, um, for at least a decade, I have been teaching in various capacities people how to public speak, how to be um, more engaging on stage, how to tell stories um, a little bit more structured with a, a little bit more point and emphasis. And so I have literally thousands of hours of videos of me doing this. And part of the prompt to put the book together was the fact that everybody kept asking the same thing over and over and over again. And I would give the same advice over and over and over again. And uh, for a lot of my training, um, if people wanted to come to like my two and a half day seminar, well, you know, prior to 2019, they were only held in person. And even through the pandemic, I've been really reluctant to do the pivot to virtual the way that other people have, because a lot of what I can teach, I can teach virtually, like we're having a wonderful conversation right now, mm -hmm. but there's something about being on stage. If you want to speak from stage, you need to be on stage. I can help people speak virtually on Zoom and be really comfortable in front of the camera because I've been on camera for 30 years, but 
Um, there's something about stagecraft and stage presence. There's something about actually being able to sit in a physical proximity to somebody and help them. Um, there's a lot of visual cues that I can't tune into over video because depending on how you're framing yourself, I can't see all of your body language. And a lot of uh, communication is nonverbal. So I need to see uh, reactions if I'm going to really, really effectively help, help and coach people. So a lot of what I've done is in person and live, but I still wanted to make something available to people who couldn't, right? Who couldn't come to, to mm -hmm. or travel to one of my events. Somebody like you who wants to be able to hear the message. Um, and I think it's important that I'm, as you pointed out, as accessible as possible. And so the nice thing about the book is that we can have the uh, text, we can have the audio book. And really all of that came from all my teaching. And so we transcribed a whole bunch of video and followed what is already an established template or outline in my two and a half day seminar. And we just basically put it together ah, into the book. I see you and repurposed it, your content. It, it, in, in a way I did repurpose the content. We added some additional stuff into the book just to make it a little bit easier, but yeah. yeah. And, and it was all transcribed. So it was, it yeah. was a wonderful process for me. Wow. Makes the writing part of makes the, makes the writing process a little easier when you've got a topic like public speaking to talk about. Well, um, it, it did help. <laughs> <laughs> but it did. Speaking of that, did you um, did you put the power to speak naked in an audiobook? Uh, it has been recorded. It has not been released yet, although that is coming very shortly. Um, I have a goal this year. When the book was released, uh, it didn't go out to a lot of fanfare. Um, and it had been pushed back because of the pandemic and a lot of things kind of interrupted what was going to be a really cool book launch with, mm -hmm. you know, media um, appearances and, and book signings and going around and doing all that stuff. And I have a healthy ego and I like recognition and I missed out on the ability to get uh, some awards when it was published last year. So I have made it a goal this year to, with the release of the audiobook, to be very strategic and reach out to my uh, friends in Canada who are SOCAN members and my friends in the States who are recording artists. And I am going to run a very, very dedicated, concentrated effort to get nominated for a Grammy for best spoken word. <laughs> so, are you, did you narrate my, your audiobook? Oh, of with a voice like this, I would have been a sin not to. <laughs> you gotta send me a copy of it so I can listen and review it. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I absolutely will. I'll, yeah. I'll send you over a copy for sure. Okay, but yeah. yeah, no, it it is in the process. We want to release it, but there's a, a strategy around releasing it around the proper date so that um, it has the most ability to have the traction to be voted for by the various academies. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, I, I'm, a, I'm an audiobook connoisseur. So yeah, as you can tell, as you can probably tell. <laughs> yeah, I, I would expect... And it's actually funny. My um, my wife currently is um, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's ischemia in her left eye that they detected two years ago, and they've been monitoring and tracking it. And it, at Christmas, it has gotten to the point where it is starting to threaten her optic nerve. And they wanted to do an emergency surgery literally that week. Like it was the week before Christmas and they're like, we need to do the surgery right now. And unfortunately our, we don't have insurance for until um, March. 
to cover short-term and long-term disability. Uh, mm -hmm. The beautiful thing is we live in Canada, so the uh, surgery itself is covered and, and wouldn't cost anything. But um, the loss of income is something that we're just not prepared to take on at this point. Um, but she, we are very concerned that the, um, the diagnosis will get worse uh, before she can get to her surgery. And when she, if she does get the surgery, even if we are able to uh, save and preserve her vision that she still has in the left eye, um, she has to keep her head down. They're going to insert a gas bubble into her eye and she has to be um, horizontal, keep her head horizontal for four weeks, I believe. Oh. Um, and like, I don't even know how you do that, to be honest. Like that to me seems a uh, very, we've, we've been looking at like those massage chairs that you sit on that have the face um, mm -hmm. cut out for it. And then a massage table for her to be able to sleep on at night, um, just to be able to keep her face down um, for this procedure. But that's one of the things that she was trying to figure out, how am I going to stay entertained? Because I can't read, can't look at any devices, can't watch the television. It's a, again, it's one of those things where you don't understand your bias until it's taken away. And we didn't realize just how reliant she was on her site until we're trying to figure out ways to adopt and, and adapt. And that is one of the things that we came up with was we're going to get a whole bunch of audiobooks. So she got herself her nice audible um subscription and has been downloading just a ton of titles uh as some form of entertainment for her while she's off and uh podcasts too oh yes yeah and audio no. although it's it's audio yeah it's funny too. because we um yeah we've got the the audio described video i set that up on the tv uh but again that's it's a little bit hard for because she uh she doesn't, she, we tested it out and she doesn't, she doesn't like the idea of not being able to look at where the audio source is coming from because uh -huh. she has to be head down. So she, she likes the audio books. And uh, I, I, I don't know if it's because one of the things that keep my wife and I together is we are absolute polar opposites. And I think anything that I do, she tends to uh, gravitate away from <laughs> so, I, because I do the number of podcasts that I do. She's like, I don't really like podcasts. I'm like, but they're so informative. She's like, they're boring. It's just people talking. I'm like, that's all an audio book is. But she audio loves the dramas. audio books. But audio, yeah. Audible originals. Oh, yeah, she likes oh, my gosh. She would love Audible originals because Audible originals are basically audio dramatized books. Sometimes just depends on what the author does. Sometimes I love them, well, sometimes it's not. It just depends on what my interests are, but still. Yeah. Well, that could be a fascinating thing to, to look into as well. Mm -hmm. And all of this relates to public speaking. How? Because people who narrate have to be able to, even though they're reading the book, they still have to have that speaking voice, the inflection in their voice, the, the tonality. They still have to be able to to use their voice to convey the emotions in the in the in in the material they read. So that's still and even podcasters, we we still do public speaking even though we're not standing in front of a crowd of people. So on that note, do you have any tips? Yes. So one of the best um, tips that I can give. Uh, and it alludes back to something that we were talking about a little bit earlier with speaking the raw naked truth. Mm -hmm. I have long believed that the thing you're afraid to say is the thing your audience needs to hear. Uh -huh. That's usually the thing that's going to draw people in. And again, it's, it's how you find your community. It's how you find your people by having that moment Okay. of vulnerability where you can say this is this is what i'm experiencing this is how i feel uh this is what i struggled with the, and and it's it's through the struggle that you can tell about the triumph and i don't forget that we need to hear the struggle the hero's journey is a model for a reason and for those who aren't familiar with joseph campbell and the hero's journey um Joseph Campbell studied all the great stories 
from uh, Greek literature forward throughout the mm. centuries and found that there was a pattern in how great mythical story was told. And it was so effective, in fact, that when George Lucas was penning Star Wars, he, he literally took Joseph Campbell's hero journey step for step for step for step and penned his screenplay. And it's so effective that if I was to tell you that Star Wars was the story of an orphaned boy who lived with his aunt and nephew or his aunt and uncle who didn't fully understand him until one day he was told that he came from a lineage of great wizards you'd go wait a second that's harry potter and yet that's the beginning of star wars because remember they they call obi-wan kenobi a wizard because he uses uh, the force to make essentially what appears to be magic happen uh, by moving objects, etc. And if you follow Harry Potter's storyline, it is the storyline of Luke Skywalker. And that's because both of them integrate the hero's journey model so effectively. But what makes the hero's journey such a powerful narrative is that when you are telling that story, you tell about the struggle because the struggle makes the triumph that much more compelling. I don't want to hear about how you made a million dollars. I want to hear about how you were bankrupt before you did it. Oh, right. Not, that's that's the. Go ahead. Well, that's the compelling story, right? What? It's it's the triumph over the struggle. Right. Like I was gonna say, you don't want to hear how the success how the the about the success. You want the journey that led to the success. That's. It's not about how it, it's not about how you got where you are i mean it's not about getting where you are or how fast you got there it's what you, it's it's how you got there like the song right says, it's the it's motivational the post poster yeah it's not the destination it's the journey exactly and what i think a lot of people when they're public speaking uh fail to recognize is that you are speaking from a place of experience and knowledge. And that's one other uh, pointer that I would give to people. I, I've heard it expressed that you never, uh, you always speak from your scars, not from your open wounds. And what that means is that you need to have um, overcome the thing that you're speaking on. If you're in the midst of the journey, wait. Wait until you can look back and reflect on it. Because when things are raw, they're still festering. They can be opened and, and the lesson isn't fully learned yet. And what a lot of people, when they first start out public speaking, the mistake that they make is, is they try to speak from the perspective that they are the hero. And in fact, when you are outlying the hero's journey from a public speaking perspective, you actually don't want to speak from the perspective of the hero. The hero is actually your audience. Your audience is Luke Skywalker. Your audience is Harry Potter. The reality is, in those situations, you want to be Obi-Wan Kenobi. You want to be Dumbledore. In the hero's journey, we have a hero who is in a state of um, stasis, unaware. Until a mm -hmm. crisis moment happens that plunges them into crisis, at which point they meet their sage and mentor, who guides them through a series of trials and tribulations based usually on experience, until they have acquired enough knowledge and understanding of this thing that they can overcome the final adversary and then have their journey home. And what a lot of people, when they first start public speaking, do is they try to speak from the me, me, me perspective, very egocentric, and I did this, I did this, I did this. And what they forget is that to be really powerful, you want to take your audience on a journey so that they can experience and learn from your knowledge. So you're actually the sage and the mentor. You're Obi-Wan Kenobi or you're Dumbledore or you're the, you know, um, what, what's his name from Karate Kid? The Sensei, uh, right? You want to Miyagi. Miyagi, you're Mr. Miyagi. You want to uh -huh. guide 
somebody through and give them the knowledge that you've acquired over years. And that's, that's really the, the key to effective public speaking is taking it from the sage mentor perspective, recognizing that your audience is the hero and that you're of service to them and you are there for them and that you're just simply there to impart uh, your knowledge in your specific niche so that they can triumph over whatever it is that they need to overcome in their life. Wow. You make me think of things, you know, you talk about public speaking, but you make me think about storytelling too, because I'm actually um, working toward becoming a developmental editor and I'm editing an author friend's work right now. And I'm having to talk to her about the art of storytelling. And you are, te- you are giving the same tips that I give her for story, um, for storytelling you're giving those same tips for public speaking. It's all whether you're writing a book or you're or you're giving a speech, storytelling. It's it's all a part. Of it, the the princi- the same principles apply. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's why they're universal. I mean, exactly. Joseph Campbell tapped into it, but it's obviously not. A, he was just the one to recognize it and write it down. It's been obviously a universal principle for at least four thousand years because he was going back and looking at works of Plato to come up with this. So when you see that, that the compelling story follows this arc, but in, to be effective in the way that you tell the story, it's the viewpoint in which you do it. All right, if you want to take your audience, if you're, if you're writing a thing down, you want to take your audience on the journey, obviously it always helps to um, do that first-person perspective of um, uh, um, taking you along that that hero within it and explaining what was happening. But even if you look at um, at Harry Potter, I mean that's the one of the best selling young adult novels of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually told from the third person, right? And and it's it's narrative in the fact that these are the things that Harry experienced on his journey. And it's not dropping you into the eyes of Harry. It, it's not a me, me, me story. It's she, a he did this. Right. She doesn't tell you what happened. She shows you. Mm-hmm. And that's what, and, and that, that, like you said, those principles are so universal. You want to show the people what, what happened. You don't want to tell them. And that's one of the things that I'm working on too with this author. And I have to work on, on that with my own writing. And I, you know, I appreciate you bringing these tips back from, to, not only for the public speaking world, but for the writing world as well, because we we definitely need to take these things into consideration when we craft our speeches or write our books or whatever. So I, I just want to say how much I appreciate this because we've connected on such a, a, a deeper level just by talking about, you know, the different and going off in our different directions. There, there was a purpose in that. Oh, and there always is, as you said, and nothing happens uh, coincidentally, right? No. There, there no. is divinity in all areas of life. And, and I've, I've known that since I was, you know, six years old, that wow. there, that all these things, um, although not always readily apparent in the moment, uh, have purpose and design behind them. And I think the, the great gift to humanity is we do have self-awareness and therefore the ability to analyze these things and recognize, as Tony Robbins says, way, way more proficiently than I do, life happens for us, not to us. Right. I, I agree with that. And life happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. And um, so... Are, do you have any other projects that you're working on? Uh, currently, I am running a, a Facebook group called Endless Stages to try and help people who, um, again, from an accessibility standpoint, uh, who cannot always uh, make it to a, a live event to do training to at least be able to give little tidbits every week. So Endless Stage is a free Facebook group. And every Tuesday I come on and do what's called Tyler Tuesday's Tips. And uh, I just take 20 minutes to really connect with whoever happens to be live with me that day and run through various tips and tricks that I've learned over 36 years of public speaking uh, in 
uh, in a quick little format. So that is uh, that is my current project. And then waiting for the border to open up so that I can get back to the live events. Uh, I oh, okay. had planned on uh, what was supposed to be one this February in Dallas. We've had to postpone it. I was looking at doing one in Florida in March. And unfortunately that has been postponed. Um, and then I'm, I, I may be speaking in May in uh, Dallas as well as uh, Phoenix. Ah, but again, okay. I'm, I'm waiting on bated breath with that. <laughs> it's a proponent to the coronavirus. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> obviously we've got the audio book coming out. Uh, this year, really going to push towards getting it to a Grammy nomination. I don't have any illusions that I will win a Grammy for the power to speak naked, but I would love to be able to stick a nice little silver and gold uh, emblem on the cover of my book that says uh, Grammy nominated book. I think that would be really cool. Ah, okay. I think it would just be fun. Okay, sounds so cool. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Maybe I can. Maybe they can introduce a new po- um, uh, category eventually about you know um, being a guest on podcasts, and maybe I can go for that too. <laughs> ah, you might be able to get. Um, there are other awards out there too, like the Webby yeah. Awards, the yeah. Hugo's. The well, I don't know about the Hugo's, but yeah, different. Ones. Well, and actually, that's it's funny that you you mentioned that. So that is um, one thing coming up on. Um, the 20th of January, um, pod pros, which is, a, a an online forum that, uh, Alex Sanfelpolino is, uh, putting on for podcasters and podcast guests to learn more about how to be, um, more effective. So they've got, uh, 13, speakers coming on i am one of them um ashley grant so if you're if you're a guest looking to speak on podcasts i'll be talking ashley graham will be there about crafting the perfect pitch to be on a podcast uh jonathan milligan will be talking about selling books through podcasting josh carey will be there talking about creating um the ideal pitch video so instead of sending an email you send a video which i think is is a, a great idea. Mm. Angela Mulrooney is talking about discovering your niche as a guest. And then for those who host podcasts, um, Justin Shank will be there uh, talking about how to grow your audience. Josh Tapp, who I absolutely love, is going to talk about how to turn your podcast into a cash machine. So how to actually monetize that message. And I think that'll be a great thing to go in. Um, They'll, they'll, have a whole bunch of different uh, guests going and some uh, great um, keynote presentation from uh, James Altisher on um, getting your podcast to be really super successful. And I'm, I'm excited to even be one of the, the speakers in that lineup. And, and that's a super affordable ticket. A, a it's online. And I think it's only $12 US and it's a, a four hour with a Q and a, so there's, that's, that's going to be a great event for me to, to wow, be involved with. So yeah, I got an email about that too, but I didn't know if I was going to be able to access it or how that was going to work. And, but anyway, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, I'll be curious to know because it, you know, I know that they're Ted style talks. So we're presenting, um, a TED style. I know my presentation is, is you should be able to get the most out of it audioly as, as possible okay. because I don't have any, I don't do any visuals with mine, but I can't, I can't state anything else about any of the other uh, presenters. But again, that's, that is my message, right? Right. Exactly. Naked. Exactly. So if I can't do the thing that I'm preaching, I'm a charlatan. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a hypocrite. So, so I, my, mine should be able to enjoy purely. Okay. Through the okay. So <clears throat> where, if people want to connect with you, um, want to get your, your coaching service, want help with their public speaking, where would they find you online? The best way to go and find me is at my website, seantylerfoley.com. Uh, Sean is spelled the proper Irish way, S-E-A-N-T-Y-L-E-R, 
F-O-L-E-Y.com. And then I have access to all of that there. Anybody who's interested in getting the book, uh, we have links there that you can go to. It's available on all of your favorite platforms anyways. Um, Jeff Bezos' site has it. Uh, Barnes & Noble has it. If uh, any of your listeners are based out of the U.S., so this is only for U.S.-based listeners, I would encourage them, if they wanted to get a copy of my book or any book, for that matter, uh, to go to bookshop.org. And the reason for that is bookshop.org is a, a wonderful site that allows you to have the uh, freedom of online shopping while still supporting your local bookstore. Right. So Jeff Bezos is flying to space on a phallic shaped rocket. Like he has enough money. We don't need to support him anymore. And on top of it, I'm not even allowed to advertise my book on his site because apparently having a naked guy on the cover breaches their um, their decency uh, policy. So I'm I'm not actually even allowed to advertise my book on their site, despite the fact that the stock image that we're using for the cover was purchased from said site. So I think there's a little oh, irony in there. Wow, yeah. But bookshop.org will connect you with your local book retailer who very likely needs the support right now. So you yeah. get the comfort of shopping online, but still being connected with your local book retailer. Additionally, bookshop.org, I don't know how they do it, but the titles are available cheaper than what you would get from any of the other online retailers. Like my oh. book retails for $17.95, and I think on bookshop.org, it's like $16.50. Um, Ooh, okay. And I have no, I don't control that pricing. It's just bookshop, bookshop.org sets it. I don't know how they do it to make it cheaper, but somehow it's cheaper there. And... Further benefit, not only do you save money, not only are you supporting your local bookstore, but they actually take a percentage of the proceeds that they make and they pool it into a fund so that local book retailers, if they're struggling, can ask for assistance in financing. So they, they have a charitable component to it to help maintain these local bookstores, which are really the heartbeat of any community, right? And, 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 and especially this day and age when literacy is becoming less and less and less, unfortunately, yeah. and there's more issues with, as you pointed out, accessibility or reading in general, um, to have that support is invaluable. And I think to date, they've raised just under $16 million to support local bookstores. So regardless of the title, if it's The Power to Speak Naked or any other book out there, I would strongly encourage people, if they're US-based, it's only a US site. Um, to go to bookshop.org for it. Otherwise, go to whatever your your favorite. Visit your local store. If you can, go in and visit your local store. If you can't, shop online and try to choose something other than Jeff's site. But if uh, Mr. Bezos is the only one you can shop with, you can go there too. Well, I want to thank you again for being my special guest this week. And guys, go out there and get the book because you will have some very um, valuable tips and tricks in the book itself, I've, I've read it. Um, actually, my text-to-speech on my iPad, on an iPad app read it to me, honestly. But I would encourage you to get that and take, the, and, and take some notes because you can use it in your public speaking. You can use some, well, most of the notes there are about public speaking, but some of the notes that we've discussed today, the tips that we've discussed today can be used for public speaking and for writing. So we challenge you today to go out there and read to get inspired write something inspiring and share your creation with the world for when you've touched one life, you've touched thousands. Thanks for joining us on Inspirational Journeys. And remember folks, your story matters. Take care everyone. I will see you next week.